Hi, I'm Neil Johnson. Welcome to Lumberjack Logic Show. Episode six we're on to, and uh, I've got my guest, Joshua Heintzman here again, and we're gonna talk specifically about Minnesota, although this does have national implications as well. I mean, on our last, uh, last piece, we got into both national and local issues, and this really fits that bill too, because um, the coronavirus, there, there's so much to cover on this subject, but more specifically, the I guess the blunt force trauma of, of massive lockdowns. Now, I am not, I just want, I want you all to hear this. I am not one of these people who believes that there's some 5G network that's causing coronavirus or just shows symptoms. That's not, that's not what this is. <laughs> the virus is a real thing, people, okay? I know plenty of people have gotten it. I never believed it was some fake thing. Like, uh, no, it's always, it's been here. Okay? There's been a lot of conversations about uh, Corona, especially early on, that it yeah. was fake. And there's no question that it's real. Yeah. Um, I think that what we're about to discuss, though, is, is a completely different category that deals with um, the management of how do you yes. handle a pandemic. Um, yet at the same time, this is not swine, swine flu. This yep. is this is not Ebola, and it ain't the Spanish flu no. at all. No, it's, it's not. No, nowhere close, people. This is not no. anything like the Spanish flu. That was. I, I'm not trying to discount, and I'm I'm gonna. Uh, I went to see a doctor the other day. Okay, and uh, I had gotten some. Uh, uh, wax build up in my ear when I was up in the boundary waters. That kind of plugged my ear, and I, okay, I was you doing were in the boundary waters. Yeah, that was in the summer. But okay. this is this is. But it still had. I thought the thing would just clear up, and it hadn't. And it's hunting season, and I can't hear right. Oh, it was no. so irritating. It was terrible. So I go in and see the doctor, and I remember I, I, uh, um, and I went to, at first to an urgent care clinic just to get it flushed, but that didn't solve it. So then I had to go see an ENT doctor. And in both instances, uh, the first one, uh, you know, I could tell both the doctor and the nurse uh, basically didn't feel that the masks were helping or that any of this was a reasonable response. Um, the second doctor, um, I just, you know, we were done so quick and I just said, can I just ask you a question? And I, you know, I said, I, uh, I've seen, you know, my photography business where I do art shows dropped to 10% of what it was last year. There was no art shows this year. And I said, so I've seen that. I said, I've also, uh, the only four people that I know of, not actually know personally, but know through a relative or through a friend that have died from the coronavirus, right. were all over 85 in long-term care facilities. And they all had multiple underlying conditions. One was 100 years old. Um, and I think the greater tragedy was that those people were dying alone, not that they, um, you know, we're all dying. I, I, I just, I, and people are so afraid. That's why there's a verse in the Bible and I'm not going to turn this into a sermon, but I, th I, there's that verse in the Bible. I think about all the time. It said, uh, where, where it talks about he who loves his life will lose it, but he who gives up his life for my sake shall find it. Um, and I'm paraphrasing just a little bit there, but those are the words of Jesus. I mean, you can't love your life so much that you're in that much fear of losing it. And this is just my own personal take. I don't know what yours is on this yet, but um, he said we've we've just used too much of a a massive uh, I can't but basically blunt force using a rock where a scalpel is what's needed. He said we need to allow people to get back to work. People need to work, uh, not only just to keep the economy rolling, but he said for their own personal psyche. Right. For, for their own feeling of self-worth. Well, uh, there's also, here again, when we talked about it in the previous show, uh, the law of unintended consequences. And, you know, so the governor may have the best intentions. I'm not going to question his intentions, although I think that there's been some very poor decision-making, and I can yes. give you some great examples. Please do. Uh, this, this thing uh, was just so poorly managed um, from the very beginning that it's just, it's almost mind boggling. You pointed out the age groups that are being most, uh, seriously yeah. impacted by COVID. Yeah. What does this governor do? This governor literally sent COVID positive patients right here in Minnesota back into nursing homes, as opposed to keeping them in a hospital and keeping them, uh, separate from that vulnerable population, causing 
countless deaths that otherwise uh, wouldn't have been uh, people that were contracting COVID. Uh, to, that's just, that's just, it's just, it's, it's crazy. I can't, I can't process the information. And why is it that in states around the country, Democratic governors were doing the exact same thing? Yeah. Either it's and a Andrew thing, Cuomo is like hailed as some great, you know, and I, it can't be understood. I, do you know? I have determined this is this is my own personal thoughts on Tim Walls. I've I've uh, I've spent plenty of my life working in sales. Tim Walls is a salesman. I mean, he's kind of a but but he's to me he's the worst kind of salesman. He's like a snake oil salesman, and he gets all his charts and he walks out and he uses this modeling and I. To go through a whole history of this would be impossible on the time schedule we have. But the modeling he's used has been every time proved wrong. I mean, we literally were buying buildings here in Minnesota. And when I say we, I mean the taxpayer. Yes. <laughs> the taxpayer was paying for the governor's uh, poor data that he was using to make decisions because he thought that the bodies were going to pile up and wouldn't be able to be handled. And so he was buying bu buildings to the tune of almost, I think it was over $6 million yes. to, to, to refrigerate the bodies. And even in here again in my own town, we're buying refrigerator trucks. Yeah. Because that was, the, that was the information that this governor and numerous other folks around the state were using. All the while we're saying, wait a minute, what are you doing? It doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at the data across the border and say, what's happening in Wisconsin? What's happening in South Dakota? What's happening in Iowa, yeah. North Dakota? And shockingly, uh, they have seen a lower death rate per capita, with which in many cases, they have wide open economies. Yes. While Minnesota had a higher death rate per capita. There's still numbers being compiled now, but we saw that all the way through the summer months into fall. And, you know, you could make the argument that Minnesota is suffering now on a larger scale because we didn't allow that herd immunity to be built into yes. the general population because we locked everything down over the course of the summer. You couldn't go into a restaurant. You couldn't uh, participate in so many other events, weddings, so on and so forth. Now, uh, it's easy to be an armchair quarterback, and I'm going to go ahead and put myself in that category. But at the same time, I was there. Um, Republicans were in the legislature month after month after month saying, Mr. Governor, where are you on this decision making? Why are you uh, determined to be the one person making decisions for the entire state of Minnesota? How money should be spent? What precautions should be put in place? What businesses should be allowed to be open? Picking winners and losers yes. endlessly. And... There was no response, no engagement with anybody outside of his circle. And it's just thing after thing, example after example of consequences. And to some extent, there should be some accountability. I don't think anybody's there trying to say, hey, we're going to beat you over the head, Mr. Governor. No, that's not the goal here. The goal is to learn from those mistakes, right? Yeah. And say, okay, well, what are we going to do going forward? And I think that you know the, the conversation that I heard prior to COVID was we're better together, one Minnesota, a lot of these sort of talking points. Apparently we're better with just Governor Walls. <laughs> Apparently we can't seem to remember those kinds of things when, until it's convenient again. And then we'll be right back at it and having the same ridiculous conversations as Republicans are being told, get in line, do the right thing, we're better together, you know. <laughs> but at this point, we're not there, clearly. We're, the governor's just gonna do whatever he wants to do. We're not. To, where's the political will in the Democrat Party right now to stand up to him? Is it is is there any semblance? I mean, so the Republicans could control control the Senate, right? Uh, you did pick up a couple seats in the House this year, didn't you? We did. We picked up several seats, and so it's a much closer majority than it was previous. So what what are the numbers right now? Break that down. So we're sitting uh, in the House. Um, I want to say at um, sixty. I'm gonna have the wrong number, so I'm not gonna say it. <laughs> okay. Well, it's 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 very close. We're five seats away from taking that majority from Democrats. Okay. So, uh, five seats, people. It's very 2022, close. Five seats. Five seats. So our argument was coming into this election cycle. We're we're looking to take the House, hold on to the Senate, and the first thing we would do in the state of Minnesota, and we said this right on the Capitol steps, Paul Gazelka, 
leader in the Senate, Kurt Doubt, leader in the House, said, we will end the emergency peacetime declaration. And a lot of times people get this a little bit sideways because every state's a little bit different. And in Minnesota, um, you, you, you don't have the same process as in other states. We don't have to meet and, and vote to give the governor the authority to continue his emergency peacetime declaration. The governor simply needed to call us back into session and give us the opportunity to vote. And so in the House, uh, Melissa Hortman, the speaker, has, uh, has stopped us, blocked us every single time. Won't even allow it to come to a vote. When we bring it up, what do they do? They rule it out of order. The speaker sits there and says, we're not going to vote on this. For those in, in, in uh, listening audience here, I, 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 that's a real key point because I, wanna, I want to, um, by, by taking it out of order and not having them vote, explain, because... You know, maybe some people don't understand it's, the political implications. It's political gamesmanship because yes. if you have a Republican who said we're ending the governor's peacetime powers and it's there in a vote versus a Democrat that votes to empower the governor to continue his his unilateral decision making, um, that shows up in a lip piece. That's a campaign issue. And when they stopped us and blocked us and continue to do so, um, that, that takes the teeth out of that conversation. And they don't have to go back to their districts and say, hey, I voted to give the governor continued power to shut down your business and stop you from uh, yeah. allowing uh, your enterprise to continue to it move It gives forward. them a cloak to hide behind, basically, because they never have to register their vote in, in a public log on this, okay? That it's never recorded and it's never said, oh, this is how they voted. They could try and play both sides of the fence. Well, you know, I mean, we just can't get it to come out for vote. I mean, they can say things like this. Yeah, everybody though, has heard the conversation. Oh, we just all can't get along. It's just Republicans and Democrats fighting. And, you know, there's just so much division and divisiveness in politics. Oh, come on. Let it come up for a vote. Yeah. At least people, you know, they elected us to go to the Capitol and to uh, let our position be heard. And when they won't even allow it to come to a vote, you know, there again, come on. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. This is not this is not real, folks. No. And this is I, I think this is one of the great tragedies, especially when we go to the national level. I believe that the 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 Congress has really abdicated its responsibility to the courts, and now that's why we have judicial activism. Uh, they are not writing the laws, they are not doing the things because they don't even want to be recorded as vote because they're so concerned about maintaining their power. This happens on both sides of the aisle. I mean, I am not going to say that that's strictly a Democrat issue. It's just that Nancy Pelosi's in there right now. I was very frustrated with Paul Ryan, um, you know, back uh, during the Obama Previous years. Speaker, right? I, it, it, that was, uh, yeah, and, and actually... Uh, you know, in uh, the first uh, two years with, with Trump there, there more should have been done, but uh, there was not the political right. will within the Republican majority. And I, I think one of the things that we're seeing on a national level right now and on a state level is, again, Trump just brought out the divisions. He didn't create them. The divisions were there. There's a lot of people that have made this about Donald Trump, right? And they yep. said, well, he's the reason. He's the cause. Absolutely not. That stuff was always there under the surface, and he just happened to be the guy to say, hey, wait a minute, there's a problem right there, whether it's media, yeah. which is clearly biased, and he recognized and called them out as fake news, because yeah. in many cases they were. And of course, they don't like being called out. No. And then, the court, and then we're looking at what uh, Time Magazine, we have the persons of the year on the cover, and uh, you know, Donald Trump would never see that kind of positive coverage <laughs> in spite of all the good things that he was able to do, yeah. grow this economy massively. He just made another peace deal. Yeah, Morocco. I, I mean, how many nominations for a Nobel Prize did he get in the last <laughs> three know. months? I don't know. It's like this, four. I mean, seriously, he's, a, you know, I mean, uh, you know, people can have a problem with his personality, is this, that, whatever. I, I just, I, I've kind of gotten past the point. Here's here's in my take on, on politics. Sure, I mean, in some ways, you know, you want the people to just be, uh, you know, line up with every value you have and to have this clean life. And but I, that's not what I'm after anymore. I've become much more pragmatic about this, and I just want people who make the right decisions right. when they govern. That's what I'm looking for. 
I, I want people who allow me, as we talked about in our last our last show, to be free. Well, decision making is you would think a simple concept, and more and more that's being taken away. I mean, my goodness, right now we're talking about um, what should we do now that we're going to issue. Uh, some kind of sort of uh, version of walking papers to those that get a uh, COVID vaccination. Like, well, wait a minute, what or, in the world are we talking about Or here? the stimulus check. You know, you can keep your stimulus. I want you to know, I don't care about this. I'm not taking some vaccine for a stimulus check. I mean, people that, I mean, if you're willing to just, uh, even if the vaccine was perfect and everything, I, I believed everything, was, if you're going to tell me I have to take it for 1500 bucks, I'm out. I'm out. Uh, that that is that is a form of control over the populace that I never want to see. Yeah, it, it's a it's almost an untold story now, and I've had some opportunities that you know a lot of folks in the general public might not otherwise have. I got to meet with uh, Robert Kennedy Jr., have dinner with the guy, listen to what you know his story is and what he's done to defend families or try to at least bring some resolution to their loss yeah. when there's found to have been a vaccination that caused harm, right? Yeah. And I'm not an anti- 1984 was that law was signed that, right? That, that was back during, I know. During the 80s, right? Yeah. And so all of a sudden these, you know, companies no longer had the kinds of liability that they otherwise would have had. And uh, this federal system was established to reimburse individuals that had suffered a, you know, suffered harm due to a vaccination. Um, that conversation is such a taboo now. You're not allowed to even talk about the fact that there have been people who have suffered, um, you know, children that have been injured by a vaccination. Does that mean nobody should ever vaccinate again? No, but it does mean we should be able to look and be critical of, okay, well, what is causing the greatest benefit as compared to risk? Yes. And in this uh, COVID conversation, uh, there's obviously a huge amount of people that have contracted COVID, that have uh, had asymptomatic um, uh, response to COVID, or maybe if they were sick, they recovered. And it's yet to be determined what kind of immunity their own bodies have been, uh, been able to generate to protect themselves uh, from further infection. Uh, there's still a lot of science that needs to be done. And then even when it comes to the vaccination, Yes, on some level it's groundbreaking, very exciting. I'm not a scientist, but I'm reading the same journals yeah. and looking at the same information as anybody can if they want to. Yeah. And, you know, I can take away some good, and then I can also say, I think reasonably, that there is some risk. Yes. And to say that you may or may not, and that we're not to this point yet, but it causes me concern. Is there a level to which a politician would say, or a point to where a, a politician would begin to say, you won't be allowed until you have the certificate demonstrating that you've had a vaccination to participate in your, 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 your state's economy or a federal economy. That's, that's a conversation that is happening, and you know, people should be concerned about that. Oh, very concerned, very concerned. And speaking of, of, of economy and, and speaking of local economies, I mean, you're, you're in Brainerd. This is a, a tourist service that's industry right. town. That's right. um, on the way here, I stopped at the Deer Stand. Uh, that's out in Deerwood. Uh, great food. My daughter Rebecca was with me, and we got the pulled pork special. Uh, <laughs> you know, because that's what the special was, and it was easy, and we could get it as we were swinging through. We called ahead and got that. Um, my uh, my tree fell over in her living room. It was quite the deal. <laughs> we get a 15 foot Christmas tree, and Whoa. this tree stand went out. So um, the one that I wanted, I found online. I could have had it two days at Amazon, or it took me next uh, close to a week, and I'd go pick it up at my local Ace Hardware in Grand Rapids. Uh, I, you guys I, take this very seriously. I, I do. I, Christmas tree's a big Christmas deal. Christmas tree's a big deal. I love Christmas. <laughs> so I went and got it from the Ace Hardware. I did not take the, the free shipping to my home. Th this is at a point where we need to decide what kind of world we want to live in from an economic standpoint, and Amazon is not the world I want to live in. It's just not, okay? Uh, I don't think Jeff Bezos needs any more money, no. and I, I, I am totally not going to, to support his, his business. I am going to support the local Ace Hardware store. I'm going to support the deer stand uh, and, uh, and other, other 
businesses that are close to home. Right. And and I'm gonna, and if I have to pay a little bit more or I have to um, put forth a little bit more effort, I went to Frame Up in Grand Rapids, great frame shop. Um, you know, yeah, could I maybe bought a cheap frame online and had it shipped from Amazon or something? You wouldn't do that. Uh, it, I'm just, I went to Frame Up. And uh, and you know what? He frames my artwork for me too. And and uh, I've got a great, we need to build community where we live. We're somewhere people, okay? Uh, we live somewhere, those of us in rural Minnesota. And you know what? Those of you in a city should find it, find the ability to be somewhere people too and support those neighborhoods and those communities in which you live and those businesses which consistently give to the to the school teams and to the uh, to the, the local uh, Boy Scouts or whatever. I mean, that's right. that's where it's at. And so anyways, but you're, well, you're dealing with this. You mentioned it. We are a 75% service-based economy in Crow Wing County. So... Uh, there's good and bad to this job, especially during uh, everything that's been transpiring over the last year. Yeah. And one of the worst, most horrible parts of being a state representative or in politics period during the last uh, months has been getting those calls from people that have been so negatively impacted. They're literally losing everything because one individual decided their business model wasn't safe. Um, and in many cases, they had complied and complied and complied at great cost, yes. putting up patios, putting up plexi plexiglass wherever they were asked to, only to be told, you know what? Your business is uh, apparently a part of the problem. We're going to decide for the next four weeks that you no longer get to participate in this economy. Um, incredibly devastating. Shutting down um, school sports. Yeah. I mean, we're talking about a category of people young people that by the grace of God are so minusculely, that's not even a word, so uh, un, it's their still risk impacted, level but their is risk so, level low, so low, so low. It, it just literally makes zero sense. The flu has a more significant impact, um, yet here we are shutting down schools. Such a minuscule impact, yet we're deciding that we're no longer going to allow these, these events to, be, uh, uh, to continue in the state of Minnesota. Um, I'm sorry, but I don't think the governor should be listening to Education Minnesota when it comes to this. I think that in this case, the science is pretty clear. Yeah. Um, like I said, by the grace of God, this group of people is not as negatively affected as those folks that are in assisted living facilities and nursing homes around the state. These people, these young people can be allowed to continue. There, there is no scenario in life where there is not risk and reward. I can't think of one. Right. Okay, there's, there's, uh, you know, to love someone, you risk a broken heart, right? But then there's reward in that too, right? So there's a risk reward scenario there. Uh, there's a, there's a risk reward scenario in buying a new car. Okay, that new car may be great. It may not be great. Could be a lemon. Uh, could be a lemon. Okay, yeah. uh, like our governor. Oh uh, no, I didn't say that. Uh, but the, uh, no, the, uh, um, but in all seriousness, this. This concept of risk reward, there is a risk, yes, to allowing the public to engage as it normally does, but the rewards are great. And we're looking at the alternative risk of not allowing people to do these things. And we've seen a, a, a severe spike in suicides, uh, mental depression, right. um, you know, uh, again, the whole issue of dying alone. I mean, if, if there's anything, you know, I. Years ago, I wrote an article, um, my dad died of cancer, and it was called Unexpected Gifts. And one of the great things, if, if you call it that, but when my dad died of cancer, I knew it was coming. You know, I, I, I knew everything. And my dad and I were able to have some conversations that we should have had years before. Hmm. And there was a great reward in that. Uh, and we were able to uh, just deal with certain things and uh, certain questions about, uh, you know, life and, and its, its meaning and eternal life and, and a whole host of things that if we did not have that time together, uh, we would not have been able to have that. And, you know, my dad was going to die anyways. Uh, you know, by the time they caught it, I think the cancer was stage four lung cancer. Um, he, he started eating healthy right away. <laughs> he found, he discovered what a kiwi fruit was. That was some of the funniest <laughs> memories. But, um, but that was a, it was a gift to have that time with him and know that it was coming. 
um, and to have those conversations. And I got to tell you, those are some of my most treasured conversations with my dad were in the last six months of his life. And it's sad that it maybe took that long. Fine. I mean, people can say a lot of things, but the fact is it did. Well, I don't think anybody's advocating, uh, neither of us, that we should take more risk and allow more people to be harmed. The question is, what should the response be? Yeah. And if the response includes separating families from each other during life's most difficult moments, I think that's a mistake. Yeah. There should be a way to allow them to be there with their loved one during a difficult time. Um, school sports, uh, education, all these categories of businesses that can function underneath safe guidelines. They complied and they complied and they complied um, to try to uh, meet those demands time and time again. And in the end, they were still singled out. Uh, and so that isn't the science. And I think that's the argument that I'm trying to make and a lot of other people are trying to point out. Um, we can uh, socially distance. We can do these things that are proven to stop or slow the spread of COVID. That's great. And then also we should be celebrating the advances in the care that has been provided. At the same time that you've seen increasing cases of COVID, you've seen decreasing cases of ICU uh, beds being taken up, or in cases where they were, the death rate has been reduced. So well, there's the death rate from happening. this has fallen dramatically, massively, massively. I mean, so cases are rising, but the death rate uh, by case is way down. And you know, I, I don't know. I mean, this gets into a, a whole host of things, and I know we're running up on the clock here. But you know, again, of the people I know that died. Uh, those people are most likely going to die this year anyways. And, and again, I'm not trying to sound calloused about that, but the, I think the tragedy was that they were unable to see their family. Now, I do know people, I know, I know of one person uh, through a friend who was down to like 5% lung capacity. So some people have gotten it really, really bad. Now she pulled out of it and, and everything was fine. Um, you know, I, I've seen people with the flu-like symptoms. I think it ran through our home. Uh, I, I, I know other people, all they did was lose their sense of smell and some people who had no symptoms at all. And so the, when you look at the, the math on this and the numbers, I, I just don't believe that the response is the right response. Well, That's it, the issue. We're, and you can go right back to the first part of this conversation. States that had uh, completely different response, still had a lower per capita yes. death rate. It's a wow. virus. You've heard the statement, spreads like a virus. Right. It's a virus. I, I think this goes back to that whole idea of control. This is something that I don't right. really think we get to control like we want to. Well, and there's consequences. And part of those consequences are economic. You go to Christy Nome State, South Dakota, they're seeing surpluses. Here in Minnesota, we spent through $2.3 billion in surplus, and we're still looking at a deficit of $1.27 billion over the coming biennium. So what does that mean? That means we're going to have to cut. We're going to have to go into places and we're going to say, wait a minute, we've got to tighten our belt. Um, otherwise, what is the alternative? Raising taxes. You know, those are just things that are going to impact us and should be considered as a part of the response and the unintended consequences like lost businesses, like what you've seen with the increased suicide rates and so on and so forth. Those things have to be considered, and I just don't think that this governor is considering them. No, I think you're right. Well, that concludes uh, episode, what is this, six, I think I said at the beginning, episode <laughs> six of Lumberjack Logic, six. Uh, I want to thank you for listening. I'm your host, Neil Johnson, with my guest, Josh Heinzman, uh, state rep from the Brainerd area. And thanks so much for coming on the show, Josh. Glad to be here. All right, thanks.